original director of the Progressive Party. Coleman Young served from 1955 as executive secretary of the National Union Labor Council. From 1956 to 60, he was plant manager of a dry cleaning company. Coleman Young was elected to serve as a Michigan Constitutional Convention delegate from 1966 to 1964. He was a director of the Group Life Insurance, Life Insurance Company. Young was elected a state senator from the 4th Michigan... From the day in the summer of 73, when the Michigan Supreme Court declared that state senator Coleman Young was eligible to run for mayor of the city of Detroit, he knew the great task before him. Every poll indicated sharp racial lines among voters. The election, it seemed, would be just one more sign of a polarized, handicapped city. But when Coleman Young stepped on the victory platform Tuesday, November 6, 1973, his call to his predominantly black supporters was not one of victory for turning the tide of Detroit city politics. It was a call for unity and a dedication to bringing the city back together again, to rebuilding it and moving forward hand in hand. The task was formidable, but Coleman Young knew from experience the odds. His pledge was the strength and conviction of a lifetime of concern for people and his city, Detroit. Coleman Alexander Young was born May 24, 1918, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to Ida and Coleman Young Sr. I Love Her is scribbled on the back of his mother's picture. He still remembers today the electrifying fear generated from her arms as she held him while the Ku Klux Klan paraded through Alabama some 48 years ago. His father was a tailor. When Coleman was but a small boy, he moved his family with thousands of other southern black families to Detroit's Black Bottom and the industrialized North. The feeling of warmth Coleman had for his economically poor but culturally rich neighborhood is surpassed only by his great sorrow at its destruction today. Roots were planted for Coleman in Detroit's Black Bottom, not only the roots of a hometown, but the basis for his thinking and his activism. The foundation for his long and history-making involvement in the American Labor Union movement was built. But first, he had to make history in his stint with Uncle Sam. His mother kept his 1941 Chevy, promising to polish it regularly, and Coleman went off to the infantry. Before he returned to Detroit, he was a member of the famed, hand-picked Tuskegee Air Corps, a totally black and totally revered flying group which served during World War II. Coleman and 100 other black airmen made history when they protested paying officers dues while they were excluded from the all-white officers clubs. The original sit-in, as Coleman laughingly calls it, resulted in a mass arrest, but charges were later dropped. The controversy marked the turning point in Coleman's life. He now knew the battle and sensed his duty. After the war, tens of thousands of workers were laid off. The first to go were black. Coleman took his place as a black leader in the labor movement, but he never lost sight of the integrated unity which the movement needed to succeed. Hal Shapiro, a 30-year veteran of the trade union movement, fought side by side with Coleman in the early struggle for workers. Shapiro today is an international representative for the AFL-CIO. I think perhaps that one of Coleman's greatest assets was his complete understanding of the slogan that we used, black and white unite and fight. He recognized the essential ingredient of unity among all workers. In 1947, Coleman was elected director of the organization of the Wayne County CIO Council. It was a landmark election. No black, 
had been in an executive position in the CIO anywhere across the nation. The union was 75% white, representing, among others, the auto, meatpacking, electrical, and steel industries. Coleman used his position for action. When he saw injustice against blacks or other minorities anywhere in the country, he sent a delegation from the Wayne CIO. Coleman joined the Michigan Progressive Party, which supported Henry Wallace for president. After a Wallace defeat in the fall of 1948, he found himself an outcast. He worked nights loading fenders onto boxcars, but after 89 of his 90 days of probation, he was fired without cause. He got a job at another plant gate, but lost it without explanation before he got to the work site inside. In 1951, Coleman founded the National Negro Labor Council and served as its executive secretary for five years. In 1952, Coleman's suspicions of personal blacklisting were proven true when he was called to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee. His testimony, as it turned out, made him a folk hero when he daily corrected a Southern senator on the committee who referred to him as a Negro. In 1961, after driving a taxi, hauling sides of beef in Eastern Market and running a small dry cleaning business, Coleman had rekindled his fighting spirit for the people and was a Democratic candidate for CONCON, the state's second constitutional convention. Despite an attempted smear to label him a communist, Coleman won without party support and paved the way for his career as a Michigan legislator. Coleman was soon accepted by the Democratic Party. In 1968, he was the party floor leader in Lansing. The same year, he became the first black man from any state to be elected a Democratic National Committee man. Coleman fought hard in Lansing for nine years in behalf of Detroit, which contains his district, and in behalf of the people who live there. He co-sponsored the no-fault auto insurance law and the Michigan open housing law. He helped thousands of Michigan's aged afford a place to live with his law giving tax exemptions to senior citizens' co-op housing. But more important, Coleman is known for his little unpublicized battles, which mean everything to the personal lives of so many. His office doors were always open. He personally read and saw to it that every letter was answered. A mammoth job since his reputation as a doer had spread throughout the communities of the poor, the jobless, and the imprisoned. As one of his longtime supporters put it, a lot of people came to Coleman because they knew they'd get taken care of. Dan Cooper, a fellow state senator, lived in a rented house with Coleman and several other senators while the legislature was in session. Uh, I first came to Lansing uh, and four, three freshmen, four freshman legislators lived together. But Coleman had been a veteran of political warfare and had been around and he was really cool compared to the rest of us. We would fight and have bitter arguments about the course of day's events concerning politics and Coleman would sit back and analyze it and sort of steer us in the right direction. And more important, he ultimately turned that into a legislative focal focus and uh, got the job done. Coleman Young has been getting big jobs done for a long time, in the military, in the labor movement, for a lot of little people in his senatorial district. But his decision to fight all the odds in the race for mayor of Detroit could be viewed as a selfish one. For Coleman is truly in love with the city of his youth. Dozens of times on the campaign trail, he met old-time Detroiters and shared memories with them. I grew up just over there, he would motioned south of Gratiot to the old Black Bottom. Today, little more than a series of vacant lots and dilapidated houses, fenced-in fields of high weeds. Once a grand, bustling community. And his mind would wander to the close-knit community of his youth, to the tough cut, Ben Turpin, who lived where he worked, on his beak, who you could go to for help, a man to respect, not to fear. It would wander to the Italian vendor's fruit truck, where he and neighborhood boys would stop every morning on the way to school. It would wander to the barber shop, where he listened to men talking about the rights of the working man, and where, at the age of 13, he was permitted to join the debate. Coleman Young's strength to make Detroit great again springs deeply from his love for the city. The Detroit, I remember, as a kid, was a warm and vibrant uh, 
community. It was a peaceful community and a very close community. Oh, and I, I have very vivid memories of uh, coming to Detroit at the age of five. And I suppose my earliest sharp memories would be the smell of fruit, fresh fruit at Eastern Market. Uh, we came here in December, it was the Christmas season. I'd never seen snow before. And I think that one of the things that impelled me more than anything else to run for mayor was to stand by and watch uh, the block by block uh, bulldozing and destruction of what I consider to be a cohesive community. Detroit uh, has all the ingredients for greatness, for restoration of its former greatness. I think we must give a special attention to the waterfront. And I think it's symbolic that uh, in the rebuilding of Detroit, the most logical place to begin is where Detroit, Detroit began in the first place, on the river at Fort Pontchartrain. And I think that, that whole area from bridge to bridge between the Belle Isle Bridge and Ambassador Bridge, uh, which is potentially the most valuable land in the state, if not in this nation, to be the beginning of a new Detroit. One of the problems that uh, elections dramatize was the fact that there is a polarization in the city of Detroit. I said uh, many times that uh, all citizens, whether they be black or white or whatever, whatever their ethnic origin, have an equal stake in the survival and rebuilding of this city. I don't believe there's any way to achieve real unity in this city at this point except by extending the opportunity for full participation to all its diverse elements and groups of that I intend to do to the best of my ability. There is seemingly a fear from uh, many whites who live in our city that uh, they will be punished by a black administration. I don't uh, believe that punishment or vengeance is productive. It's a negative approach. I do not intend to discriminate against the, the white citizens of Detroit. And you can be sure that I don't intend to discriminate against its blacks, its Latinos, and its women. All citizens recognize now that crime is a threat to all Detroiters. And together, we must work to eliminate crime, and more importantly, to reverse the economic conditions which produce crime. Uh, the city's businessmen certainly have nothing to fear from me. Every section of our community will benefit by placing people and tax-producing businesses where we now have vacant land and abandoned homes. Uh, I intend to make every effort to expand the economic base of this city, starting at the riverfront and going out into all communities, not only the method of making Detroit a more attractive place for all people, but also in order to provide the additional city revenues will make it possible to offer full and adequate city services to all people. And that would range from police protection across our city, to the picking up of garbage, to the provision of recreational facilities to all the people. All the people of this city have a right to expect adequate city services. That is a primary objective of my administration. Sometimes out of tragedies, we can get the most positive results. I believe the kidnap, murder, of the two young boys did more to shock this city and this state into the necessity of all the people coming together in order to turn our city around than any single event. I believe there's a general feeling and recognition throughout this city that we must hang together or hang separately. And I intend to do everything in my ability to bring us together and move us forward. I believe that the feeling is there 
the opportunity is there, and I believe that it can and will be done if we all work together. Detroit history will mark 1974 as the year of its first black mayor. But there's much more important history to be made in the 70s in Detroit, and Coleman Young is sensitive to the challenge. It is a time which offers new promise for decent jobs for all, a clean and attractive city to live in, safer streets, better shopping services in all neighborhoods, profitable new businesses, and hope for the spirit of a community of people. Coleman Young is not discouraged by Detroit's past problems. He is committed to making Detroit again the city of his youth and of his dreams. More importantly, he is saying to all Detroiters that now is the time to put aside the past and join in a united effort for the rebirth of a great city. This year, the anti-tobacco lobby tried to cut $30 million, which would help South Carolina's small farmers. Ed Young wasn't even on the floor for the vote. Instead, he and Earl Butts have gone hand in hand to make agricultural policy that works against small farmers. Big tobacco oil and fertilizer companies are making the record-breaking profits while the PD small farmers are going out of business. John Genrett wants to turn around farm policy in Washington. The record proves we need John Genrett in Congress. After the people of the PD work all their lives, pay taxes and social security, they deserve a life of dignity when they retire. John Genrett knows that fixed incomes and inflation don't mix. Ed Young apparently doesn't care. He was one of 20 congressmen who voted against a needed increase in social security benefits. It's hard to imagine the PD's 60,000 senior citizens voting for a man who votes against them. John Genrett's vote is for the people. We need John Genrett in Congress. John Genrett sees a lot of reasons why people are spending more today and getting less. When Ed Young votes against efforts to roll back fuel prices and high interest rates, the people suffer. When Ed Young supports inflationary economics, which allow big business profits to go up 15 times faster than American wages, it's clear where his interests lie. When John Genrett is elected to Congress, his interest and his vote will be for the people, against inflation. The record proves we need John Genrett in Congress. In some areas of the PD, there is one doctor to care for more than 3,000 people. The life expectancy is the lowest in the nation. John Genrett refuses to stand by. I'm going to do something about health care for the people in the 6th District. I support the second medical school. And I believe it's absolutely necessary that we have a regional health care center here in the PD. Ed Young has voted against better health care time and time again. We need John Genrett in Congress. If a child in the PD wants to build sandcastles, John Genrett thinks we should help him. Because his dreams are the future of the PD. John knows that the best we can offer him is good schooling. Ed Young has consistently voted down appropriations to improve our children's chances for good schooling and dreams come true. His votes lay impossible tax burdens on local homeowners and small businessmen. John Genrett has children of his own. When he gets to Congress, he'll vote for them and the PD's future. <laughs>